These statutes are not just stone and metal. They're not just innocent remembrances of a benign history. These monuments celebrate a fictional sanitized confederacy, ignoring the death, ignoring the enslavement, ignoring the terror that it actually stood for. We cannot be afraid of the truth. Good afternoon, I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for the Washington Post, and welcome to Washington Post Live. You are in for a fun and provocative conversation on race with two outspoken men I've interviewed on this subject before. Mitch Landrieu was the 51st Lieutenant Governor of Louisiana, the 61st Mayor of New Orleans, and is the founder of E Pluribus Unum, an organization that is bringing people together across the South around matters of race, equity, opportunity, and violence. Wynton Marsalis and his trumpet are world renowned. Among his awards and accolades are nine Grammys and the Pulitzer Prize for Music, which, which was a first for jazz. Mitch and Wynton, welcome to Washington Post Live. It's great to see you both. Right, it's great to be seen. I didn't know Mitch was gonna be knotted up. I'm not. Oh man, I, I'm, I, I thought you were gonna be dressed up, so I didn't wanna be behind you, so I thought I'd get in front of you. <laughs> But I'll you take y'all, but, uh, both of y'all are clean, man. I feel, you know, I'm, I'm underdressed. I, but you but I'm, I'm happy Whitten, to be here. You look Whitten, good. You're Whitten. all right. You're, you're, you're <laughs> a genius. So you, you I wish, when, I'm so happy to see you. I wish I could reach over there and hug you and kiss you. But yeah, even man. if we were together, yeah. COVID wouldn't let us do that. <laughs> right. We got we to gotta share all one right, of them handsome snowballs. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you two. I'm taking, I'm taking control back of this conversation so we can talk about this. Um, the nation right now is in the middle of a conversation on race, and it has spun from, from racial justice to equity and opportunity, but also into the, the removal of Confederate statues. And Mitch, you um, were in the middle of it there in New Orleans a few years back. When I interviewed uh, Winton a couple years ago, um, 2018 in, in New York, I asked him about this because you, it, it was Winton who sort of lit the fire in you to do something about this. And here's what Winton said when I asked him um, if you reached out to him because he was a native son or did um, he reach out to you? And here's what Winton said to me, quote, it's really, it's just really two middle-aged people who played trumpet in high school who've known each other for years, sitting down, having breakfast, talking. I was going out of town. He was talking about the tricentennial. I didn't set out to talk with him about those statues. And yet you eventually did. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start with you, Winton, to talk further about why you felt it was important at that breakfast, talking with your middle-aged friend you played trumpet with in high school, why it was important to you to talk about the Confederate statues in New Orleans? Well, we talked about a lot of subjects. And uh, we talked about crime in the community. He was saying he had to go visit parents. He was tired of going to see teenagers and young people who were being killed by violence, a celebration of violence. He talked about the black uh, Mardi Gras that used to be held on Claiborne Avenue and the city ran a causeway through it so that the black people couldn't gather. And that uh, he was trying to get it removed and reinstated and then some people in the black community didn't 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 remember when the causeway was there and then we started talking about the tricentennial and we talked about that we talked about a lot of subjects our families things that we wanted to do and that was one of those issues but but you you zeroed in on the robert e lee statue what was it about the statue that was particularly uh, bothersome they lost it's, it's, it's very clear you know my great uncle was born in 1883 he didn't like the statue. He made me aware of the symbolism of it. It's not something I would have necessarily paid attention to. It's not like we sat, sat around in the neighborhood talking about Robert E. Lee's statue. But from a symbolic standpoint, you know, is, 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 is England getting ready to put up a statue to, to George Washington? We, they lost the war. They fought a war to, to maintain a way of life that was not maintained. And there's no reason to give back victories that were not earned on the battlefield. If anything, it's disrespectful of their fight. And, uh, and then, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Wynton. No, I just think, I think Mitch, one thing I'm going to say is he said he didn't know whose jurisdiction it was. He said he was going to check on it. He came back. He called me. He said, you know what? Damn, if this thing is not in my jurisdiction. And uh, he said he would act on it. And, and he did. 
Well, this is a good opportunity for you, Mitch, to to jump in. So from your perspective, that breakfast with, with Winton, um, how did that push you to take action? Well, you know, sometimes when, you, when you're trying to get things done and you're trying to figure things out, nothing really fits. And then somebody puts a piece of the puzzle in your mind and then things start to take shape. Uh, and when Winton said that to me, I had already, you know, worked for 30 years as a state legislator, as a lieutenant governor. Uh, we created the first African-American Heritage Trail. This wasn't, you know, my first foray into it. 1960, my daddy was one of only two legislators that voted against the segregation package. Um, and there are lots of stories about being in the middle of a fight for racial equality and racial justice. But when Winton told me about those monuments, it made me kind of feel stupid because I, I walk by those monuments all the time and I never really understood or was aware enough to know how they fit into the larger message of racial inequality and white supremacy. And when he did that, I, you know, I describe it like him hitting me in the head with a bat. He was nice, <laughs> but, but that's what it felt like. And of course, my initial reaction was, oh, I'm not doing that. That's not my stuff. And then I found out that it was my stuff. And then I had to look at myself in the mirror and say, look, if you have power, if you have agency, what are you going to do with your power and your agency? Are you going to do it to make things better or are you just going to walk by it and let it be how it is? And letting it be how it is, is not um, an alternative anymore. And so those monuments, as important as they are to get them down, they are, they are symbols, they are stone and metal, but what they represent is much more insidious than the physicality of them. They represent a notion, an idea, that somehow white people are superior to black people and it forces African-Americans to walk by them every day and feel less than. So when Winton told me, he, he, he forgets the next thing he said to me, which was really impactful. He was like, he said, man, Louis Armstrong left because of those statutes. And when he said that, I had just gotten finished, um, you know, or, or was thinking about uh, The Great Migration, a book that Isabella Wilkinson wrote on the warmth of uh, other yes. sons, which one, is one of the great books book. in, in the history of the country that talked about how much the South lost because people like Louis Armstrong left. And if you think, if you go read that book and you think about all the human beings, the great intellectual capital, the raw material, just the, the genius that left the South and went someplace else, I'm sitting here trying to rebuild the city with everybody else thinking, man, how are we gonna do this without the best and the brightest here? So it occurred to me as we were preparing for our 300th anniversary and we were rebuilding the city, what I kept telling the people of the city is we're not going to put it back like it was. We're going to put it back the way it should have been if we would have gotten it right the first time. And I, I was talking that talk. And when Winton told me what he told me, I said, man, wow. Well, if I want to walk the walk, this is part of what has to happen, but it's only the first part. And by the way, we were in the middle of reforming the police department at that time under consent decree. We were in the process of downsizing the jail. We were doing all kinds of other substantive stuff. And if the city wants to live with integrity in all of its beauty, in all of its history, in all of its texture, those monuments were essentially just a big fat lie and an ugly red thumb right in the middle of this beautiful city that we were trying to recreate and get right because we had gotten some of it wrong to begin with. So it all just kind of smacked me in the head. And I was like, look, you know, you can walk away from this, but you'd be a sorry son of a gun if you did. And you wouldn't be able to explain it to your grandkids. So go do something about it. Winton, were you surprised that Mitch actually followed through on what you said <laughs> and what you suggested? Yeah, I was surprised when he called me. I, I mean, I was surprised. I, I wasn't, it wasn't because it wasn't, it was part of the conversation we had, the most serious part of the conversation where it was just about violence in general, violent images and about culture. So yeah, I was surprised. He said, the only thing I want you to do is write an article. I mean, he had to take all the heat for it. He had to deal with all the politics of it. Uh, you know, I, I liked how he referenced his experience already. And also his father, my father loved his father too. And the black people in, in New Orleans loved his father when we didn't really like politicians. And um, I, I always try to make the point that I was always outspoken about this stuff. In the seventies, I was like that. I was never, so the conversation me and him had, I don't want to mischaracterize it because sometimes you get in a, in, in public or you start to talk and your your actual natural personal relationship and the way you actually are uh, gets gets covered by the fact that you're we didn't we weren't anywhere outside of our personalities you know we talk uh, about things and so yeah he shocked me and he did what he said he would do you know um i, I can't remember if mitch i think it was winton who just said 
um, that you t you took all the heat and you did take a lot of heat for removing those statues. Can you talk about the opposition that you faced in New Orleans as a result of doing the right thing? Well, first, yes, I will. First of all, um, I didn't do it by myself. There have been many people for many, many years um, who were unnamed and unknown, who marched in the streets of New Orleans. I remember uh, Lolas Eli, R Rudy Lombard, Aretha Castle, Haley, uh, the first Mayor Morial, the second Mayor Morial, Sidney Bartholomew, a whole group Watch of people. And, and, Uncle Bob, and, he's key roll calling great people. That's all people. And, like my and, and people, and, and Avery Alexander, who got dragged down the steps, um, Reverend Marie Galatis, there was a group called Take Them Down NOLA that, that, that swarmed the streets. All Everybody helped. It was a, it was a group effort. However, um, it was not easy. It was hard. And, you know, the thing, the thing that bothers me is that it was much harder to do this than it should have been. This should have been, this is, this is an easy thing to do, actually. If you look at where we are in this country and you go back and ask, who were we? Who did we say we are? Should we act a certain way? Those monuments have no place on public spaces in places of reverence. They, in fact, are monuments to something called the lost cause. They all were put up intentionally after the Civil War ended as statues of reverence. Those are the kind, statues of reverence are the kind of things you want kids to emulate. That's the point of putting them up. You want kids to emulate them. So what did they symbolize? They symbolized through the voice of Jefferson Davis and, and his vice president, white supremacy. Now, these monuments were put up to revere people who tried to destroy the United States of America for the cause of preserving slavery. That one statement freaks people out still sometimes. And people won't just acknowledge that. And the African-American community, many other people get upset that people won't just acknowledge the simplest thing and why that was so wrong. Thank God they lost the war. Can you imagine had they won the war, where we would be right now um, and what would be happening uh, in the country? And so to me, this whole argument about Confederate monuments is, 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 is done. I mean, history has written its story about it. It's, we, we need to get past that and get into the Black Lives Matter moment and what it is that the country needs to learn about full participation by African Americans in at the table of democracy as equals in the United States of America. And think about what that means in our education system, our transportation system, arts, culture, and music, in the way cities are run. Just yesterday, the Louisiana Supreme Court, our Supreme Court in New Orleans, six white justices, one black justice, upheld the sentence, a life sentence of an individual who stole a really very small thing, like a hanger or a flashlight or something. It just came across yesterday. There, there are institutional laws that are biased that produce in opposite results. That would ha that's what has to change. And these monuments are just a reflection of that attitude that has allowed that institutional bias that we walk by every day. It's, it's perfectly symbolic of walking by institutional racism every day and not understanding it and saying to yourself, well, I'm not a racist because I didn't want that statue up for that reason. The only reason I like it is because my daddy took me there to watch a Mardi Gras parade and that's all I remember about it. But now I said, well, now that you know who put it up, now that you know why they put it up, now that you know that young African-Americans walk by every day and felt less than, now what you gonna do? And <laughs> That, that's the, that's, that is the question about institutional bias and racism that we have to understand in our country and we have to commit to do something about. Winston, jump in. One thing, let me, one, one thing I want to say is, let's, let's for a minute contemplate what it feels like to a young white person that a loser has a statue in the middle of your city. They lost. Okay, that's my, my, what, I, what I think about this statue. You lost a war. And I disrespect your dead by giving you a place like a winner. <laughs> Man, it's almost comical. So, you know, the, 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 the stupidity of the arguments around it and all this about heritage. Hey, it was a good try. Y'all lost. Let's roll the page on that. And uh, in terms of the, the, the symbolism, I'm not a big statue person in general. Any kind of statues, to be honest with you. But the fact that all the productive things that we, we have done together and we could do, just here in... Mitch give the roll call to Lola Eli, Rudy Lombard. That's people older than us. You know, that's a, that's, that's a roll call of people who, 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 were, who were fighters, warriors. They were, they were out fighting for social justice and for, for equality, not just for black people, for white and black people. We have a mutual cause. 
We have a mutual heritage. We have a, 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 a familial mutuality. And that we overlook all of that to keep enforcing the kind of fake white black system. And it's killing us. Look at Republican Democrat. Look at all the splinter groups we have now. Everybody's fighting for agency in their corner. We don't have to agree on everything. But we don't need to be celebrating celebrating people who lost in a sad cause. No, they don't. They don't deserve a statue. Put put those statues down. And and it takes up. If you think about it, it takes up a very limited amount of space. And if we started over, let's just say we we were starting from scratch, and we said, look, we're gonna have seven hundred spaces in the country, and in those spaces, we want to put something that reflects who we are collectively in a deep, rich way. Would, would you would you think we'd get to those 700? You wouldn't get anywhere close to it. You'd be no. thinking about Mahalia Jackson. I'm going to get in. I'm going to get in Wenton's, Wenton's lane with music. You'd be thinking <laughs> about Louis Armstrong, Louis Armstrong right? Armstrong. Jelly you'd Roll. you thinking about Billy, Billy, Billy Holiday, Jelly Roll Martin. <laughs> you'd be thinking about what, where are all the That's women? The, I mean, think know. about it. I mean, all, all of these guys. So, so what I'm saying is when people, when these guys who are historians say people like me are stealing their history, what I'm saying to them is, if you are responsible for curating our history, you you are guilty of historic malfeasance because you left everybody else the hell out. And you only <laughs> included a couple people in four years of our time. We're 300 years old. What happened to the rest of it? We're all different kinds of colors and textures and deep. It's a mosaic. That's who we are, and especially from New Orleans, where we believe in you know music and, and food represent life. And, and, and government, like jazz represents democracy. Wenton can give you that riff because it's right. right. Food, the gumbo is the same thing. And, and the thing is, out of, out of many, we are one, e pluribus unum. That means everything goes in the pot. We all put in, we all take out, and we're the better for it. That's the idea. And those monuments don't reflect that. They're the exact opposite. They're the get the hell out of here, you know, message is what right. that is. And that's not right. 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 You, you know, um, Mitch, it, it, you did this in 2017, it came down the decision. Um, it was a, a two year legal process. And you you systematically went through it was the executive, the legislative, judicial, you had support from all three of those branches for the removal removal of those statues. But what we're seeing now, I really like to get your thoughts and then Winton's as well. What we're seeing now are protesters forcibly removing statues um, of Confederates and others who um, are on the wrong were and are on the wrong side of history. What do you make of that? Well, I have a lot of thoughts about it. Um, actually, it was a three and a half year process. I actually thought about it a year before I actually took any action. From the day they went and you know smacked me in the head and I started thinking about it and tried to get out of it and didn't want to do it and then figured out that I, I, it was my responsibility and then figuring out exactly how to do it. The thing that made me move was uh, the awful murders that took place at the hands of Dylan Roof. Um, and and, Charles and, and I, I was just like, okay, you know what? I, this, we, we're not talking about this anymore. Um, this is this has got to happen. And when they took down the flag in South Carolina, and by the way, in New Orleans, my dad and some folks took that flag down in 1967. I couldn't I couldn't make any intellectual distinction between the flag and the monuments. And that's the thing that kind of made me jump up and say, now's the time to go. It was the moment to make it happen. But I thought that it was important, and I still think it's important for the country to make itself go through, not over, not under, not around, but through the issue of race which means we have to talk to each other about it. So the public process was important to me. We had four public hearings. People then exercised their right to take us to court, which they did. There were seven courts, 13 judges. They then made an appeal to the president. So we went through all three branches of government, all levels of government, and the democratic process produced the result that we have. Now I'm fully appreciative and understanding of how people are impatient and they wanna tear monuments down. Um, I don't want to count as violence that's against the law. I think it's really important that we as a country go through a very aggressive and intentional process of truth and reconciliation. But it also means that people of goodwill have got to acknowledge what was done wrong and make a commitment to change. When you don't do that, pro protest, you know, is, is naturally going to come and people are going to take things into their own hands. I understand it. Um, I wish we could do it th the, the, through the legal process because I think at the end of the day, we'll be better for it, but it takes longer, it's harder, and it's much more frustrating.
Um, and I should tell tell folks that you write all about your experience of removing those those statues in your book in the shadow of statues. A white Southerner confronts history. Winton, from your from your perspective, I mean, through your musical compositions, you have been addressing issues of race and inequality and justice. What do you make of protesters forcibly tearing down stat tearing down statues? Um, and not doing it in the way that that Mitch did it. Well, I think that if you take just what Mitch said, that Dylan Roof went into a church and started shooting people. He's an extremist, so he he went to an extreme degree to to make his point. If you, if you go back to uh, the girls who were who were killed in Alabama and the changes that that created in the country, many times extremist acts bring about change. So whereas I'm not a, an advocate of breaking the law, uh, I, I avoid breaking the law myself. I think that when you have protests, and it's like another point that he made is that at a certain point, you protest, you stay within the law, you do things legal, you try to do what's right. Hey, the law is going to send that man that, that, that Mitch was talking about, he's gonna, his life is over now but for taking a spoon out of a restaurant or for having some weed in his pocket. So... I'm, I'm never, I'm not going to say I'm an advocate for some violence, but uh, something about makes a protest for real when it's not, I'm going to tell you when to protest, what time you're going to do it, and I'm going right. to set out all the parameters for you, and then you can go home. So, uh, you know, do protests go mm -hmm. too far? Do people take things too far? Yeah, they go too far, but that's how we get to change. Uh, right. And, and Jonathan, on that, you know, there's a, there's a big argument we're having in this country about who's a patriot and who's a traitor. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'll throw a little history on you, but, you know, when Muhammad Ali, when Cassius Clay decided not to fight for America and we hated on him for a long time. And then when he changed his name to Muhammad Ali, we were like, man, you got to be kidding me. Now everybody in the world thinks he's one of the greatest men that ever lived. Dr. King, the last year of his life, according to the, the friends who were with him most of the time, said he was despondent and he was not revered when he was alive. And now he's somebody that we love. Colin Kaepernick took a knee. He didn't turn his back on the United States of America. He took a knee. He wasn't trying to hate on America. He was trying to call America into uh, a more, a, a greater life of integrity about being who you are and saying what you are. Many of these protesters are doing the same thing. So protesting is, is covered by the First Amendment. It's the First Amendment because the founding fathers knew that the only way for this democracy to survive was to be able to criticize your government. Those protesters are patriots. They're not traitors. The traitors are the guys that are up on the monuments who try to fight a war to destroy the United States of America for the cause of preserving slavery, which is anathema to the very idea of America, which is very simply stated, which is that we all come to the table of democracy as equals. Now, we all know when the country was born, we were born into a moment of hypocrisy. Slavery was our original sin. Racism continues to be our Achilles heel. And for some reason, man, we are hostile to looking at ourselves and seeing that very fact, admitting that we were wrong as a country. You don't have to be at fault for that in order to be responsible for fixing it. So we now know that we're hurting ourselves and we're hurting each other. So let's just get let's just get on with it. As Wendon said, y'all lost. Nice try. It's time to move on and get a whole lot better and let everybody in. Okay, here's what I, 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 I go ahead, Winton, and then I, I have a follow up to what you just said, Mitch. No, I'm just uh, um, you. We can't. You can't. Freedom in the in the freedom is not something that I, I can't. We we have to. We we are searching for a balance. When you're sanctioned violent force, you're sanctioning them to commit acts of violence. When your sanctioned violent force decides it is going to prey on a community and then they are compared to crimes you have in a community, I hear it all the time, black people are killing black people, then the people who are, who are killing other people are criminals, they're not police. There's a difference between a sanctioned violence. I, I, a good friend of mine is a police officer, retired in Chicago. I went to their ceremony for his son being becoming a policeman. The oath that they take is so heavy of how, they, how the, the constraints on their use of force. That when you sit and hear that oath and how heavy it is, and you think this oath is being violated, it's not the same as what citizens are doing. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going with, with what Mitch is saying in terms of uh, just we're a country that has a relationship 
to, to, to periods of upheaval and then we go back to what we've been doing. We need to change our basic cultural mythology. And mm -hmm. we're, we're going through the process of doing it and it's gonna be painful and it needs to be painful. And it's not something that can be controlled. And it's the same court systems that are corrupt and stuff. I mean, Muhammad Ali, we loved him when we were growing up, but I have to say that what, we did not like Dr. King because on the street level, we felt like Dr. King was too conciliatory and we were more about Malcolm X's approach, which was more of a Hollywood approach. You know, it was, it was more like, we're gonna do this and we'll get guns and all of that. Okay, they never got any guns or did any of that. It was something more for a movie. Dr. King was a tactician and he put a coalition together. But for a kid of nine or 10 or 11 at that time, you didn't understand the sophistication of it. It goes back to what Mitch was saying about when his father and them took the flag down at that time, he didn't know mm -hmm. what was going on. But now we're, you know, we're grown. We, we, we have the ability to form coalitions and to create meaningful change in our country. And that's what we need to do. That's what we want to do. And that's what we've been working on for a long time. And now is a good time to, to kick, that, kick that can further down the road and try to keep it down the road so that we don't have the same thing that happened in the 1980s happen in the, in the, in the uh, upcoming years. Well, to, I want to take on that, that phrase you just, you just mentioned, Winton, the, the cultural mythology that the country has to, has to take on. And one of those things is, while folks are focused on tearing down uh, the losers in the Civil War, tearing down those Confederate statues, there are others who are, who are agitating and pushing for the removal of other statues, of George Washington, of Thomas Jefferson, and others among the founding fathers who owned who owned slaves, who were on the wrong side of that of that part of our American history. Where do you fall on that issue? Should those statues be removed, Mitch? Is uh, is my, my okay, feeling wait. about that? Ahead, my, my my feeling is that let, when a, when an attacker grabs you. They teach you grab their thumb, okay, pull their thumb off. Now, I'm trying to get a thumb off, and now you're reaching for the whole hand. I'm trying to, okay, let's, I don't want to, it's, it's like chew what's in your mouth. It doesn't mean there are always going to be people who will go to a, another level and another level. And you can't dismantle a country because the country is born in slavery. That's what it is. Are you going to kill yourself for something that's wrong with you? You're gonna, you, you have to, your mythology, you have to determine what it is. That's something that's up for debate. But I wanna say one thing about what happens in the media. The media is always looking for the most extreme viewpoint. Like if we were on this call now and Mitch and I started to call each other names and all of you and fight and I called him up, man, that would go viral in a second. We about okay, to do we've that. had heated, we've had arguments, we talk, we get, we get heated and we talk about stuff with a lot of passion. If we were to do that same thing we naturally would do and get up from a table, and hug each other after really a, a heated <laughs> argument about an issue that we both feel serious about. Man, that would be, man, you see what those two dudes did, boy, they got into this, man. Skane was for real with Mitch, man. He was telling, no, he was telling them, we're not, you know, let's get to something. Let's get these statues down. And then when we get these statues down, then let's talk about that across, a, but instead of me being able to get this statue down now, I'm now talking about should George Washington speech, should Thomas just should Abraham Lincoln step, should Frederick Douglass be a, don't 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 give me I'm I'm eating a, I'm eating some gumbo man don't bring turkey and chicken and beans and rice and all that on the, you, you see? know no I, I, I it's all about you know food in New Orleans it's all about right. food but wait let me <laughs> right. let me make the let me see if I can make these two points quickly back to um back to the process so. You know, back in the day, Stokely Carmichael and Malcolm X had had enough of Dr. King and John Lewis and other folks. And it was all about by any means necessary versus nonviolence. That conflict has been with us forever. It's not going to get resolved. You have to you have to be balanced and patient. At the end of the day, you know, you've got to have the energy to get it done. I completely and totally understand folks who say, man, we've been trying to do this the right way and nobody will listen to us. There is no redress of grievances, so we have to take things into our own hand. Uh, my sense, my preference would be to do it the legal and thoughtful way. But, you know, the question rises, what if injustice just won't be moved because people refuse to do it? What do you do then? And that's what democracy is supposed to be about, which gets you into a whole bunch of other issues about gerrymandering and legislatures and do the people in Congress, Congress really represent the people that are electing us? Those are things that we have to think through. But on the issue of race, it is going to hurt us because it's painful 
to acknowledge things that are hurtful from your past and to recognize that either you participated in it, you benefited from it. It's like getting a fight with your brother. Like if, if Wenton, if I was over at Wenton's house and we got in a fight, his mom would make us would say, I, we're sorry to each other. That's hard to do. And then say, I forgive you. That's hard as hell, especially for two young kids. But if you can imagine doing it across history, I mean, the pain that we have to go through, but that's what's necessary. So that's number one. Number two, I, th I would just caution, and I completely agree with Wynn, don't let them take your eye off the ball. Um, when I started taking these monuments down, all the people that didn't want me to do it, the first thing they said was, oh, man, you can't do that. Where's it going to end? Where's it going to end? Right. Like I had to answer right. every question right. in the world about every monument that had ever been put up. And I said, you know what? I don't know where it's going to end. I know where it's going to start. It's That's going right. to start right here with these four. Now, because I had people That's on right. both sides mad at me because I didn't do enough. And then people said I did too much. But you know what? We took down four. And then all of a sudden, over time, other people started thinking. So I would say, because these monuments are not just stone and metal. I want to get these monuments down. Then I want to attack the idea that allowed them to go up and allowed them to stand. And then get right. that done. Now, if other people want to talk about Washington and Jefferson... If there's a deeper conversation that's rich, it's worthy, it's one that starts to have it, but don't let it get in the way of this very specific thing. There's 700 monuments, they ought to come down, and then we need to start redesigning the institutions of America to get rid of the idea that allowed those monuments to go up and allowed habitual offenders to get passed and allowed mass incarceration and allowed the kind of behavior that we see from some police officers. Now, Wenton alluded to this. I was a mayor. I had to go to funerals of police officers that were killed in the line of duty and talk to their spouses when they died. I also had to go to the emergency room and to funerals of young men who were killed, both of them. At the end of the day, both of them were dead. Their lives and their families' lives, it's, it's critically important that we get back into really understanding that humanity belongs to us all. And you can't, black lives matter. And when white people say, well, all lives matter, the only answer is, well, all lives can't matter if black lives don't matter. And I think it just should be really clear in the country right now that we have devalued African-Americans. I could take you through a half hour history lesson of all of the institutional barriers that were in place that made it much, much harder, clearly, for African-Americans and for anybody else. We need to rectify that, not just because it's the moral and just thing to do, it's the right thing to do, and it's better for the country. And these monuments represent a view towards the past. That's why they need to come down so we can clear out space and create a vision towards the future and put something in those spaces that lifts us up and not breaks us down, that unites us, not divides us. That's the bigger right. point than whether or not you're going to take down a piece of metal. And see, and that's well, one of the, re the, what you just said there, Mitch, is one of the reasons why a lot of people were hoping you would run for president. A white Southerner talking about race in the matter of fact, honest, blunt way that you do is something that sort of washes over people in a hopeful way that there's someone who gets it and who can, you know, shepherd us through that this very difficult thing in our in our history that has haunted us from our founding. Winston, I know you wanted to jump in. I'm going to give you the last word. What's your last thought? Well, I mean, I, I, I agree with what with, with, with Mitch is saying on that. I think that a uh, yeah, you know, as a brother, you get messed with a lot. And and a lot of times I can tell you when I was growing up, I thought, man, my my guys, they're not going to make it through this gauntlet that's put in front of them. And a lot of them didn't. You have a gauntlet of, of and it, it's, it's on the left and the right, not just the right. You're getting it from everywhere, the intellectual community. And I want to finally just conclude by saying that one thing that Mitch brings to stuff is that he's also a cultural. He knows the music. He's in theater. He had a minor in theater. And uh, we don't have that type of cultural consciousness in our political community. And it's really sad because we're a variegated nation, but we do have a common culture that we've never focused and concentrated on. So it's given us a kind of spiritual hole in our center. There's a, there's a battleground for us. And we need to figure out how to come together and be for real with redressing the grievances of the past by taking the best of what we achieved and moving forward into the future with force and with power. So I'm honored to be here and talk with you with Mitch and oh, Jonathan, thank you. you. Wenton Marsalis, thank you very much for being here. And you mentioned, you mentioned your father earlier on, the great legendary Ellis Marsalis, who also passed away earlier this spring. So I wanted to give, send you my condolences 
on the on the passing of your father, um, but also for Jazz because he was indeed a giant. And Mitch Landrew, Mayor Landrew, thank you very much for for being here for being on Washington Post Live today. Thank you, yeah, thank right. you, Jonathan. Yeah. Went, thank you. I love you. I'll see you soon. Yeah, ma'am. Love, respect. Next time, right. I'm gonna be ready. All for right. You. All right. Okay. All, All right. right. Y'all. Next week, we have a full lineup of conversations on topics that range from America's health future to the impact of COVID-19 on schools and food systems. On Monday, we'll continue our series on race in America with the former mayor of Minneapolis, Betsy Hodge. And on Tuesday, March for Our Lives founder and student activist David Hogg will join the program. Check it all out on WashingtonPostLive.com. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Thanks for tuning in.